Greetings, my name is Tom Irvine and I'm the instructor for the series of shock and vibration webinars and I again thank the NASA Engineering and Safety Center, NESC, and Dr. Curtis Larson for making this series of webinars possible. So in the last couple webinar units we've been discussing shock response spectrum and a given time history has a unique shock response spectrum but the converse is not true. So in other words, given a shock response spectrum, there are multiple types of waveforms that can satisfy that SRS within some reasonable tolerance bands. And that, that actually gives quite a bit of flexibility to our testing. So a way to think of this is that the SRS specification method is really an indirect way of specifying a shock test. So let's say, for example, that uh, some field shock event is, is measured and then it's uh, enveloped using an SRS curve, uh, perhaps with some uh, statistical uncertainty margin added. Then that turns into an SRS spec. So then the customer takes that SRS spec as well as the test article into a test lab uh, for the shock test. Well, the test conductor does not have to reproduce the actual field shock event, which uh, might be impossible to do anyway, so given practical limitations. But rather he or she can uh, synthesize a different sort of waveform uh, that will still satisfy the SRS and, and therefore meet the specification. Now there are some caveats with that. Um, some people are concerned, and justifiably so, that uh, if we use a different type of uh, time history waveform that that uh, is really not representative of the of the field shock even though the SRS is satisfied and uh, people can become concerned for example about uh, linearity and um, whether the, the test item is really a multi-degree of freedom system. And my quick answer to that is that um, up in an upcoming webinar we'll, we'll address uh, some of those. There's actually a another type of uh, a shock and vibration test is called uh, time web waveform replication and that's a case where, where the idea is to actually replicate the the field shock or, or vibration time history in the test lab but let's let's save that for an, uh, a future webinar so so today we're going to uh, just assume that we can take our SRS spec and come up with any type of reasonable waveform we can to satisfy it and we actually have uh, two different methods for doing this. Uh, one is wavelets and two is damp sinusoids and actually the second method also includes the wavelet method but uh, more about that later on. In, in fact I think I'm going to take this unit 27 and div divide it into two parts because uh, the, the two parts are each uh, somewhat lengthy. Uh, I think that might make the mo most sense. So uh, be, be, this we'll call this uh, part A and this will cover wavelets so please also uh, download and, and view Part B, which will be the damp sinusoids. Okay, so continuing on. So, our, well, first of all, when we talk about wavelets, you may be familiar with the type of wavelet that uh, that I will call the cousin to the Fourier transform. Well, this is not a cousin to the Fourier transform. This is this is a more brute force, basic type of wavelet that's a shaker so shock wavelet. And the goal of wavelet synthesis is to synthesize an acceleration time history that can uh, either be used for a shaker test or, or for a numerical simulation of a shaker test. So here's a, a small satellite payload and it's attached to a slip table which is driven by an electromagnetic shaker and I don't really have the background of what that particular payload is or even what kind of uh, shock and vibration testing it may have been subjected to, but let's just sort of assume that it was subjected to a shock test. Now a shock test may be performed on a shaker table if the shaker's frequency and amplitude capabilities are, are sufficient. And any time we can do a shock test on a shaker table, that's a good day because uh, this type of shock testing tends to be more repeatable than other types of methods. But, but there are some limitations. It's only good for some 
either either benign to moderate shocks and, and, and certainly not for pyrotechnic uh, shock simulation. So if we're going to do this shaker shock approach, we need a time history to satisfy the SRS. And there's two different, at least two different candidate methods. I'll just mention two. Uh, we could use damp sinusoids or wavelets. Now, one of the requirements, regardless, is that the net velocity of our drive uh, signal, the corresponding velocity to the drive signal, must have a net value of zero. And I'm going to say that the net displacement must also be zero. Well, in, in reality, we could uh, uh, tolerate a, a slight uh, net displacement as long as the shaker table could recenter itself uh, thereafter. But just for simplicity, let's say that the net velocity and net displacement must each be zero. So that's the requirement for our time history synthesis, regardless of what type of waveforms we use. So what we're going to do is we're going to synthesize a series of wavelets to satisfy an SRS specification for shaker shock. And this will bec become more apparent as we go on how, how, how we're going to go about doing that. Now, the neat thing about wavelets, they are intentionally and purposely derived so that each individual wavelet will have zero net displacement and zero net velocity. And the neat thing about that is, is that thus if we have a series of wavelets, that series also has zero net displacement and zero net velocity. And, and, that, and that's very important for shaker shock testing. If we had a series of damp sinusoids, uh, we would not meet those requirements just with, the, with that series, so we would have to also apply what's called a compensation pulse. And that, and that gets kind of messy, and uh, for, for a variety of reasons, which will become more apparent, uh, the wavelets are really the way to go. <laughs> so what we're going to assume now is that our, our shock control computer will do either do one of the following two things. So it'll either accept an ASCII text time history file, which will be the uh, series of wavelets, or, as an alternative, it will accept a wavelet table. So yeah, with some control computers, you can actually go in and uh, tweak all the parameters in the wavelet table. And that would be another way of, uh, uh, of doing this application. Of course, the, the control computer uh, most likely has its own built-in way of uh, synthesizing a pulse, uh, probably using wavelets. But it's, it's kind of fun and interesting and insightful to do this just in our office computers <laughs> prior, prior to the test. And another thing that we really run up against is we have to remember that with a shaker system, particularly for shock, there are definite limitations. There is the stroke limit that or, that or the displacement limit. That's particularly critical if we have a lot of energy at low frequencies. Velocity is a limit. Acceleration is a limit. Force pounds is another limit. And then we could also talk about current and voltage and even temperatures all being limitations uh, for a shaker test system. So a lot of times we're kind of just on the edge of, we have a specification that's on the edge of what a, a shaker shock system test system can do. So we, ha we really have to be careful about uh, coming up with a, with, with a wavelet series that will fit within those uh, parameters I previously mentioned. OK, so I think we talked about that slide already. So here's the wavelet equation. And really, it's a lot more simple than it might look just off the bat. So this would just be for an individual wavelet. We'll say W sub m is the acceleration at time t for wavelet m. Then we have an acceleration amplitude, a sub n. And here we have two sine functions. And, and really what this is, the, the second of the two sine functions is, is really the main sinusoidal oscillation. And it's 2 pi f, f sub n. That's the frequency of the wavelet. Then we have in parentheses, we have t. That's the independent variable time. And then we have t sub dm. Well, this is a delay time. So what we're actually going to do with these series of wavelets is we're going to have them staggered with, with some delay. Now this first sign term that we skipped over, this modulates the amplitude of the second sine function. And it has the same argument inside the brackets as the second one, except that in this denominator here, we have n sub m. 
And n sub m is what's called the number of half signs. And it's an odd integer greater than or equal to 3. And, and again, this equation is purposely configured so that the as we integrate to velocity and then double integrate to displacement, that uh, all of the three amplitude metrics will each have a final value of zero. So it's the final acceleration is going to be zero, the final velocity is going to be zero, the final displacement is going to be zero. Then this wavelet is defined over a particular duration, so starting at, at the delay time and then up to the delay time plus this term here where we have the number of half signs divided by twice the nominal frequency of that wavelet. So this is the equation. And uh, just looking at this equation, you might not be able to really figure out offhand what it really means. But if we, if we do an example, it becomes so much more clear. So this is, I'm going I'm to call this just a typical wavelet. It's just a single wavelet. And it's acceleration g versus time in seconds. And you can see there's an offset here or delay of 12, 12 milliseconds. Then the frequency is 74.6 hertz. And here we have, if we count the number of positive and negative peaks, altogether there are nine. So we call this the number of half signs. So again, this has to be an odd integer greater than or equal to 3. So this is our 9 half sine wavelet with its other uh, corresponding parameters. And uh, I forgot to uh, call out the amplitude, but it looks like about maybe 32 or so g there for the peak amplitude. So again, the idea is that we, we, we take a whole series of these wavelets with staggered offsets. And each individual wavelet can have its own amplitude, its own frequency, its own number of half signs, and obviously its own delay as well. And we just sort of kind of mix and match these so we can uh, satisfy our shock response spectrum specification. But actually, there's another consideration as well, is that for, for, our, for our, our case here, satisfying the SRS, is it's the primary goal, but it's not the only goal, because we want to get the most bang for the buck. So what, what we want to do with shaker shock testing is use the least amount of energy so that we can still satisfy that specification. So that means we want to come up with a, a base acceleration uh, input signal that has the least possible acceleration, the least possible velocity, and the least possible displacement, all within some uh, reasonable duration. So this, this is it's not just a process of synthesis. It's also a process of optimization. So let's take a particular specification here. And this is actually a published specification uh, from Mill Standard 810E. And uh, before you, you, you dash off any emails to me, I realize that this Mill Standard is up to Rev G or almost H or what, whatever. But uh, that's the, I think this one is in the most recent revs as well. So let's just go with it. It's called the crash hazard for ground equipment. And we have SRS, Q is equal to 10, with the three natural frequencies and the corresponding peak accelerations for each of the three natural frequencies. So this could be, I guess, maybe there's a radio that's mounted in a, in a military truck or a Jeep or a Humvee. And that Humvee is going over washboard roads and rough terrain. And, and there's a possibility of a crash. And in the event of a crash, uh, the radio needs to remain functional. So let's just go ahead and go with this. And we're going to synthesize a series of wavelets as our base input time history. And as I mentioned, we, we have uh, multiple goals here. We want to, of course, we want to satisfy the SRS specification within some reasonable tolerance bands. But we also want to minimize the displacement velocity and acceleration of that base input. So let's go to our MATLAB. We call up our MATLAB here. And we're going to go to our vibration data GUI package. And we're going to do something new today with the GUI package. Well, the first thing we, we want to do is we'll copy and paste these breakpoints, or, or you can call them coordinate points. And I'm just going to copy and paste them and put them into the MATLAB 
uh, workspace. Now, if you know a better way of calling in the data to MATLAB, that's great. You should use your own way. Another thing we could have done is we could have copied and pasted these into like a, a Word document or some text file, and then we could have called that text file into MATLAB as well. So that's another way. But this way, I think, is, is, is as good as any way. So let's go to vibration data, the GUI package. Take a moment to come up. MATLAB's a little slow. OK, this week we're up to version 6.2 and rising. So in this case, we're going to have a shock response spectrum. It'll be acceleration. And we're going to use the wavelet synthesis option. Let's click on begin. OK, so this is wave vibration data underscore wavelet underscore synth dot m. This script synthesizes a time history to satisfy an SRS specification using a wavelet series. And we already have our array preloaded into MATLAB. We'll just call that SRS underscore spec. And our next step is to read in that data. OK, there's a whole bunch of parameters that we need to go over. Um, one is the number of trials. So this is the number of candidate waveform series that we're going to come up with. And if we were doing this in earnest, I might set that at 1,000 or 2,000. But just for webinar purposes, I'm only going to put in 75 just to make this exercise go a little quicker. The sample rate. Now, our highest natural frequency is 2,000 hertz. So our sample rate should be at least 10 times that. So let's go ahead and we will put in 10 times that. So we have 20,000 samples per second, or you could say 20,000 hertz, if you like. Um, we can either limit the time history points or set the duration. And let's set duration. And now, the way, the way I set duration, and this may be a, a, a different mm -hmm. emphasis than the mill standard, is what's our lowest natural frequency? Well, it's, it's 10 hertz. One period of 10 hertz is 100 milliseconds. So I want to have at least two uh, periods or two full cycles at 10 hertz, and maybe even just a little extra. So I'm going to say 0 0.24. That's 240 milliseconds. And that's just, that's just what I'm going to do. If you want to try something different, go ahead. Uh, there's a couple other parameters we kind of skipped over. Let's go ahead and use the 112th octave spacing. That's for the natural frequencies. We'll pick English units. Q is equal to 10. In our strategy, let's use approximate reverse sign sweep. Now, j just through some logical reasoning as well as empirical experience, uh, it, it turns out that it's, it's, in many cases, it's best to do the high frequency wavelets first and then kind of sweep down to the low frequency wavelets. We'll go ahead and, 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 and use that. And it's, it, it's not an exact science. It's not a perfect process. but Let's just go ahead and do that and see what we get. Uh, optimization weights. Well, we, we have five parameters we're con concerned with. We're concerned with what is the highest individual error. So that's the error with respect to the SRS of our synthesized time history relative to the specification SRS. So what's the, the highest error at any given natural frequency? Then there's a the total error. Peak displacement, peak velocity, peak acceleration. Now, right now, I have all these weights as one. The, and, but these could be real numbers. They don't have to be integers. And if we were more concerned about displacement, then we could set displacement at 2 or 3 if that's what we needed to, uh, if that was the critical parameter, for example. So uh, again, you know, of course, as, as usual, I, I want you to do this as a homework exercise. And, and, and certainly feel free to vary these parameters. Uh, if you have your own specification, you can put in your own specification and, and just play around and, and, and have fun with this. Well, let's go ahead and run this for our case here. So I'm going to, OK, intermediate results are written in command window. So let's go to the command window. And this is going to take you know a minute or two, maybe two minutes. So what we're doing is going through all the different trials. Now, I, I need to fill in some gaps and explain to you what's really going on. But you can see for each trial, there's a peak acceleration, 
a peak velocity, a peak displacement, a total error, and the uh, individual error. And these are all parameters we want to minimize. Okay, so while we're waiting for that to go, let's go back and fill in some gaps. And I want to go through what the software is doing. And this will just this will just be an overview of what the software is doing. So let me see if I can go back to slideshow there. Okay, so okay, there's our setup that we just did. So step one, we generate a random amplitude delay and half sign number for each wavelet. Again, the number of half signs has to be odd integer greater than or equal to three. And these parameters will f will form a wavelet table. So we do that for each natural frequency of interest, which in our case, for example, we're running this at 1 12th octave spacing. So then we synthesize an acceleration time history from the wavelet table. We use that equation I showed you a couple slides back. We then calculate the shock response spectrum of the synthesis. Now, what we're going to do is, okay, we just finished our, I'll, I'll, we'll talk about these plots here in, in a couple, two or three minutes. Okay, so let's see. So we, we calculate the shock response spectrum for that uh, synthesis trial, and then we compare it uh, relative to the specification. And at, at this point, we're, 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 we're going to do some modifications on that given trial, that given candidate, because we're going to go back and try and, and scale those wavelets so that uh, the, S, the synthesized SRS matches the specification SRS as closely as possible. So we're going to work within each wavelet to make it the best it can be. Or I should say within each wavelet series, which of course is a, so, so it's, both, it's both individual wavelets and, and a series that we're trying to make the best it can be and they can be. <laughs> Got a little tongue tied on that one. Okay, so then we generate a revised time history. We repeat steps three through six until the SRS error is minimized or an iteration limit is reached. So there's only so many times we can go back and rescale those wavelets and eventually at some point the error will start uh, uh, increasing or diverging. So then we calculate the final shock response spectrum error for that uh, given candidate. And we also calculate the peak acceleration values and we integrate the signal to obtain the velocity and then again to obtain displacement. So we get our peak values uh, for each of the three amplitude metrics. And then we Step nine is we repeat steps one through eight many times. Well, for the example that we're doing in class here, many times is equal to 75. But, but again, if you're doing this in earnest and, and you really have a tough spec that you're trying to meet, you might want to do it 2,000 times. And then we, we, we choose, what we do is we go through a kind of a ranking process to rank these waveforms in terms of their uh, SRS error, the two error parameters as well as the three amplitude metric parameters. So we go through a ranking process and then we, we, we choose the, the one that gives us uh, the, the best overall rank in terms of those parameters. And, and we are using those weighting uh, factors as, as we make that selection. So let's go back and see what we have for our in-class exercise then for our wavelet synthesis. Okay, figure one, I'm pulling it over from my second monitor. This is acceleration in G versus time in seconds. So this is a series of wavelets. And what we've tried to do is do the high frequency wavelets first and, and then uh, gradually sweep downward to lower frequencies. Now, does this actually look like a crash hazard shock or any type of shock? Well, no. <laughs> is that a limitation for this whole uh, testing Methodology, yes, um, but but, the, but this most of the time this works well enough. But if we are concerned about nonlinearities and multi-degree of freedom behavior and and, and other things, uh, there are other tools we can use, uh, particularly if we need to replicate the recorded field waveform in the test lab. But 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 today we're saying we don't need time history replication. That that's a topic for the for another day. So we're saying as long as we meet the SRS, that we're good to go, even though that's a funny looking shock pulse. Now, the final acceleration is zero. I'm going to pull over the integrated velocity. 
So velocity inches per second versus time in seconds. So this is uh, somewhat oscillating about the zero baseline. And the final velocity is equal to zero. That's important. We have displacements. Now, by the time we double integrate to displacement, displacements can be somewhat one-sided. But uh, we just need to make sure that the peak displacement is within the, the stroke limit of the shaker system. And our final displacement is equal to zero. That's good news. Now, here's a, a non-trivial plot here. This is our shock response spectrum. Q is equal to 10. So we have peak acceleration in G versus natural frequency in hertz. There are three black lines. The middle black line is our nominal test spec. And then in this case, I have plus and minus 3 dB tolerance bands, which is probably a typical bands for uh, a shaker shock test. But uh, if you have different tolerances, you could uh, apply those. And then we have the positive and negative curves. These are from the SRS of our synthesized acceleration time history. And you can see in this case, both curves are well within our upper and lower tolerance bounds. So it looks like uh, we're good to go for our shaker shock test. Let's, well, before we make that final decision, let's, let's go and take a look here. So in this case, the optimum of the 75 was case 57. And you can see it uh, has a peak acceleration uh, just below 20 Gs. Peak velocity uh, just within 33 inches per second. Displacement uh, less than 7 tenths of an inch. And, and then the maximum error. So we would need to verify that these three parameters are suitable for the capabilities of our uh, shaker test system. Uh, having a peak displacement about uh, of 0 0.671 inches is probably OK for most shaker systems. But we might want to be just a little extra careful on that and give, give ourselves a little extra margin. So again, if we were doing this in earnest, we might want to do 2,000 trials instead of 75 and maybe even bring that peak displacement down to, say, a half an inch peak. OK. And let's see what else what we have here. So let's go back to our GUI. Well, yeah, let's, let's go to our GUI package here. And let's just pick out a typical frequency, natural frequency. Let, let's see what happens at, say, 200 hertz. So what we're going to do is take, we're going to take our synthesized acceleration time history. I'll, I'll just call it Excel, Excel underscore SYN. And we can save that to our MATLAB workspace. Now, if we want, we could also save the velocity, corresponding to velocity. We could save the corresponding displacement, the corresponding SRS, and the wavelet table as well. In fact, let's go ahead and, and save the wavelet table. I'll just call it, I'll just call it wave table. And our wave table is, has four columns. So let me go back to the uh, our MATLAB uh, package here. So I'm going to show you what a wavelet table looks like. <laughs> OK, I made a mistake. <laughs> Let's try this again. Wavelet table. I needed to go back to the list box and, and correct that. OK, save wavelet table. OK, one more time. I don't mind making mistakes because you, know, you, you might make some of the same ones. So, <laughs> so we, we have uh, five columns of numbers. Now, MATLAB kind of does a funny thing. It, 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 it scales everything, in this case, by a factor of 1,000. But, but the first column is, is the natural frequency of the wavelet. The second column is the acceleration in G. And then for the third column, we have the frequency of, of the wavelet. And then the fourth column, we have the, the number of half signs. And the fifth column is the delay time. And I, wa I want to, OK, I, I made a mistake. I'm sorry. Let, let, me, let me start over. <laughs> 
the first the first column is simply the wavelet number. Now, it's really an integer, but uh, but but MATLAB is making it appear as a real number because of the funny way it does that a thousand. So he, I'm correcting myself. So the first column is actually the wavelet number. The second column is the amplitude acceleration g. The third column is the natural frequency in hertz. The fourth column is the number of half signs. It's an odd integer greater than or equal to three. And then the fourth column is the delay time. And it looks like the delays are all zero, but you know, we have to remember that uh, MATLAB is doing a funny thing here with that uh, 1,000 factor. In fact, let's let's go and see if we can look at this table in a little more detail. So let's see if I can do this correct. So if I take the first row and all the entries, let me pick a, maybe the second row. Or let's do a couple rows here. Okay, in this case, we don't have that funny 1,000 factor anymore. Uh, this first column here is really meant to be an integer, and that's the wavelet number. Again, we have acceleration in G for the wavelet. Then we also have the frequency in hertz for, for the wavelet. We have one twelfth octave spacing, which means as we double the natural frequency, there's uh, 12 steps. In fact, I can uh, show you that a little bit better here if I... Okay, so as we go from 10 hertz to 20 hertz, there's 12 steps in there. And, and this this column here, this fourth one, it's, it's really an integer, but uh, in order to put things in a wavelet table in MATLAB, we have to have uh, everything be a real number. I, I, there's probably some other way of doing that that you, you might know a better way. So the, like, this is the number of half signs, and then you can see the delays are not all equal to zero, although some are, uh, but the various delays in, in seconds there. So we could, uh, say, we could export this as an ASCII text file, and then we could use that for future reference, or we could input these numbers into a vibration control computer that will accept a wavelet table, or or will let us otherwise manually edit a, a wavelet table. Well, manually editing would be a real pain, but <laughs> I'm sure I've done that before, uh, way back when I worked in a test lab. Okay, so the next thing we want to do then is is one of our favorite things that we want to take this acceleration time history. Okay, there's the velocity. Let's go to figure one. And we want to apply it as a base input to a spring mass system. So again, that's one of our favorite things to do. In fact, just to kind of remind you, let's go back to the to the slides here, the PowerPoint slides. So this, this happens to be the same one we just generated in class. This is our synthesized acceleration time history. It was case 57. And you can see off to the right the uh, different metrics there characterizing that uh, waveform. And then the corresponding velocity time history in inches per second versus time in seconds. The corresponding displacement, which in many cases will be the most important of all the parameters because uh, uh, frequently, frequently we're running up against the, the stroke limit when we do shaker shock testing. And then the shock response spectrum, we've seen this plot before. We have good compliance uh, to the nominal spec within the plus and minus 3 dB tolerance bands. So here we are now. We want to take that acceleration time history and apply it as a base input to a spring mass system, a single degree of freedom system. And we've talked about this uh, system before. And of course, the next step would be we would uh, draw up a free body diagram and use Newton's laws to sum the forces on the mass. And we would derive the governing equation of motion. And then for the case of an arbitrary input like we have, we would then uh, use a convolution integral, which is inefficient to solve. So we would instead use a David O. Smallwood ramp invariant digital recursive filtering relationship. So let's go ahead and, and, and do that. And Looks like uh, I have the c a case called out for 400 hertz, Q is equal to 10. So let's keep this plot in, m in mind here. This is our SRS. And what we have here is at 400 hertz, we're into the plateau region, and we have 75 Gs. So let's go to... Let's go back to our MATLAB GUI here. 
So let me type in vibration data. Okay, in this case now we have an acceleration time history and we're going to do single degree of freedom response to base input. Let's go to that option. We, we've done this before on many occasions. This is one of our favorite things to do in this class. And preloaded into MATLAB we have Excel underscore SYN. That's what I call that acceleration time history. We're going to run 400 hertz natural frequency. Q is equal to 10, what's equivalent to 5% damping with our English units. Let's calculate. We get our descriptive statistics here, and we find out that our, our peak positive and peak negative values are both approximately equal to 75G. So that's all well and good, as it should be. So we have our, our couple of plots here. We've seen this before. This is our synthesized uh, wavelet series to satisfy the SRS. It's kind of setting up uh, somewhat like a reverse sine sweep. So here's the acceleration response at 400 hertz, Q is equal to 10. So you can see the effects of some dynamic amplification going on. The peak here is less than 20 Gs, and the peak here is roughly 75 Gs. So the spring mass system is amplifying energy at its natural frequency. So this shows what's going on in the time domain for that particular oscillator for its acceleration time history. And we might also be interested in the relative displacement time history for that same frequency and Q value. So we have relative displacement in inches versus uh, time in seconds. Relative displacement could be important for, for a number of reasons. We're going to be getting later on in a future webinar uh, talking about Steinberg's criteria for electronic components. And we're, we're going to be looking at uh, circuit board deflections. And in that case, relative displacement will become very important. And also, there are times with an isolated component. Now, at 400 hertz, this is probably not an isolated component. Uh, typically, when we isolate components, we might have a natural frequency below 50 hertz. Uh, of course, it depends on what the mass of the object is and other parameters. Um, but, but still, we, we, we might be interested, even at 400 hertz, what the relative displacement is. And, and, and it, there are possible. Uh, concerns with uh, uh, stresses as, as well as things like optical alignment and, and, and sway space and clearance that would, would be affected by relative displacement. Again, that would be more critical at lower natural frequencies, probably not an issue at 400 uh, hertz, but, but, but still this is an interesting plot to take a look at as well. And that's available to you as, as one of the tools in your toolbox. So we found out that at 400 hertz, our SDOF response was about 75 Gs. And that corresponds to these points here, the, the red curve and the blue curve. And you can see uh, close to 75, er, there are about 75 Gs at 400 hertz. Are, the, the red and blue curve are almost intersecting that black line at those two frequencies. So what the SRS, just as a reminder, what the SRS algorithm does is, is, is it does the, this single degree of freedom calculation for each of the family members. So for each natural frequency of interest, uh, in this case spaced at 1 12th octave. And, and that's what it's doing. But, but then there's this data reduction process that goes on. So instead of retaining the whole response time history, the SRS instead just retains the peak positive and peak negative values for that given oscillator. And that becomes the SRS plot. So the SRS function uh, takes care of all the bookkeeping for us. So that's just another little thing you can do there uh, with your synthesized uh, waveform. Oh, there's something else I, I wanted to mention too. Let's go back to our, um, our SRS synthesis here. So let's go to shock response spectrum, wavelet synthesis. And after we, we synthesized our waveform, oops, oops, it's disappeared now. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and let's just do 10 trials here. I'm just going to do a trivial case, everything the same, because there's something else I wanted to show you. So just type in a few numbers here. So this is only 10 trials, so the results might not be that very good. Because I'm going back and showing you now something that I skipped over that I want to go back and mention. 
Okay, so you can see with only 10 trials, not quite as good compliance, but we're still within the tolerance bands. Uh, displacement, peak displacement, uh, rather one-sided, and it's up to about 0 0.85 inches. That might be a little too close to, to, to our limit for comfort there. And then the reverse sine sweep type. Uh, but what I wanted to show you, and I skipped over later, is we can also export that acceleration time history into a NASTRAN file. And then you could call in that NASTRAN file to say FEMAP or or you could bundle that NASTRAN file in the in the case control deck for a modal transient run for NASTRAN. So if we do that we can uh well one thing we want what might want to do is we have acceleration in G's for the purpose of NASTRAN, we, we might want to make that inches per second squared. So so we might want to apply that scale factor. And then I'm just going to call this synth.nas. So let's go to, let's see if I can call up that file here. OK, I'm going to fumble around a little bit to get to where I have my MATLAB. And what I call, I called it. Uh, synth.nas. So here is a, a NASTRAN uh, friendly mm -hmm. file for that acceleration time history. So we have ex the time in seconds, acceleration in G for each of the time history points uh, put in this table here that is compatible with NASTRAN. So then we could do our modal transient analysis. That's another thing we can do. Um, just sort of to summarize, we're about done with wavelets here. Wavelets are very, it's a very user-friendly format in terms of uh, what a shock table can do. Uh, it's, it's a very, it, it tends to be a very robust method for, for, for performing these shaker shock tests. It's, it's, it, this waveform, this wavelet series format very much lends itself to, to shaker shock testing, especially, or, or among other reasons, because the final acceleration and the final velocity and final displacement will all, will all be zero. And hopefully it's, it's, it's repeatable too. Uh, anytime we're dealing with shaker shock systems, there's always the potential problems of fixture resonances and uh, other things going on with that shaker test uh, systems. But uh, in, in many cases, this can be a very stable and just really good way to go uh, for performing that shaker shock test. OK, uh, so I think that uh, just about I've got a couple more slides. So this is just what we did in class. So we, we went to our function vibration data underscore SDOF underscore base, which uh, calculates the response of a single degree freedom system to base excitation. Then we applied our wavelet series, and we got an acceleration response of 400 hertz. Q is equal to 10. And OK, then we also had our relative dis deflection plot, which I'm omitting. OK, so our next unit that's going to be a separate recording is going to be on damp sign synthesis. So uh, please check back for that. So we'll see you soon. Thank you. And goodbye for now.